Now I want to uh, introduce uh, our speaker, Randy Smith. He has been a friend of mine for a number of years. I have said on multiple occasions that I consider him one of my mentors uh, when it comes to the Word of God. He's one of the final, finest Bible teachers I've ever sat under, and I value his friendship uh, and his camaraderie in the, the ministry of the gospel. He is a pastor. He is a um, Bible Institute leader. Uh, he runs a, um, an, an annual discipleship program that is quite extensive. He leads uh, multiple tours every year to both Israel and various lands of the Bible. And he's come to do what few people on this planet could do, and that's teach an overview of the book of Ezekiel in one weekend. And so uh, I'm, I'm really excited that he's come and that his church has released him for, for this ministry this weekend, and I, I trust that you enjoy uh, his teaching. So, Randy, come and bless us. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Mike. We'll do the part that no one has to possibly remember first. Um, I, uh, many, many years ago, got the opportunity to leave New Jersey. I was at a student at Philadelphia College of Bible back when they were downtown in the old campus before they got the rolling hills. You know, we had the winos on the front step and the broken chalkboards. That's the real Bible college, you know. <laughs> and uh, back, back in the day, um, I got a professor came up to me and said, um, have you ever considered going to Israel? Now, at that time, the only Jewish person I knew in my life was my dentist. And because of the pain inflicted, I didn't like him. <laughs> So I said, no, I had, this, I had this kind of visual image of an entire country of dentists, and I thought, this is terrible. But he said, I think you'd do well with that. And, and I decided that I would take uh, the next semester and go to Israel and fell in love with a people and a land, went on to get uh, a bachelor's in theology and then a master's in Near East archaeology, and then decided I didn't like getting dirty. So what you do then is you switch your major to something that allows you to teach so you don't have to actually get in the hole. So now you let other people dig it up and you stand there like, hmm, I know what that is, you know. And so what I did was I moved over to uh, a, a doctorate in comparative religion with its emphasis on Mishnaic rabbis, which means I am fully qualified to say, would you like fries with that order? <laughs> Because absolutely nobody gets a degree in Mishnaic rabbis. Uh, but the truth is that I have what your local rabbi has. That's essentially what it is. And I was the Christian guy that was in the group. Went on to develop um, travel study, and we created a series of travel study uh, journeys that are now in Israel, Jordan, Egypt, Turkey, Greece, Cyprus, and Italy. That's the area that I normally cover. And some of you will see that out there, we have a number of groups that are going that have um, places open on them. One of them is Life and Land of Jesus, and that's available for you. Um, there's also a new program that I started three years ago, which was called Paul's Response to the, to the Roman World. Read Paul's Response to the Pagan World. This is going to Italy and dealing with what, how did believers deal with the world when it was entirely pagan? Now, the reason I started the program is because talk to your grandchildren. Paganism is on the swing. There, and virtually every major institution in our country is promoting what they call pluralism, which is polytheism, which is paganism. It's just another nicer name. So when we say we're a pluralist country, what we're saying is we're desperately trying to be pagan again. And so as a result, I thought, how did they do it? How did, how did Paul walk into a room where everybody was a pagan and preach Christ? Now, I understand how he did it in Israel where there were a bunch of Jewish people who studied the law, but how do you do it when everybody in the room has a different God? And it's all self-styled gods, the ones they made up in their own mind, that the ones that are always giving comfort, peace, and luxury to them. I used to think it was really weird when you go into the Bible and you see that you know, the Edomites had their own God, the Ammonites had their own God. Then I realized the Americans have their own God. He is the mush God. He is the one you sing God bless America to when planes crash into your buildings. 
And then the next day you begin legislation to make sure that, no, that in no shape or form is the God of the Bible represented in your public school. But, but we sing to him when we need him. And he's always for whatever war we're for or whatever party we're on. And he always loves our flag. That's the American God. We have sculpted a God no different than the Edomites. And what's happening in our world is that we need an answer to paganism. How, how many of you have, uh, have traveled to the Middle East? Any, any, of you, any of my former travelees went with us? Okay, so you're used to my you know, running uh, like crazy. I, I've taken these feet and gone everywhere Paul's been. I've walked all of the life of Jesus and all of the life of Moses. I've walked the Sinai Peninsula with camels a hundred times. And what I was trying to figure out is not just what text they left me behind, but what can I understand about the archaeology, geography, the, 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 the history, the culture that will weave those interdisciplinary studies together? I, I want to take some time with you, and I want to look at a book that, frankly, gets charged with all the weird stuff in, in, in the world. Any weird group of, uh, or cultic group that wants to say they got their theology will go to Ezekiel, because it's like Shakespeare. Everybody thinks they should read it, but nobody actually does. <laughs> and one of the reasons is it's a confoundingly confusing book if you allow the complexity to confound you. So before I say anything else, let me say this. One of the tricks the enemy uses is to make very simple things so complex that it takes a room full of pundits to say big words that at the end of which you are as confounded as you were in the beginning. We currently have a problem. People are crossing our border. The word fence comes to mind. But no, what we have are pundits explaining to us the psychology of the reasons why it's happening. And I keep saying, <coughs> fence. Because the obvious becomes confoundingly hard. You know you can educate yourself into stupidity. <laughs> and paganism has a way of doing that. I, I want to I talk today uh, in a number of directions for you from this book. And i got to tell you, it's a little bit, this is an awkward thing for me. Because really what I do for a living is open up text and start. That's what I do. Can't do 48 chapters in five hours. Not going to happen. I will tell you that the Bible School, Great Commission Bible Institute, is a school that does one thing that no one else does, and that's the reason we open the school. We give students a no notes, wide margin Bible. And then we do the 1189 chapters of scripture, and at the end they have a study Bible written in their own hand. And I will tell you, last year's graduates would sooner give up their right arm than their Bible, because they got a lot more invested in their Bible than their right arm. And I'm, I'm serious, one of the worst days in the school's history was a young man left his Bible in a hotel room. There was weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth going on in the bus. They sent it back. But, for, but, but that's how important it becomes to a person who really puts their time in. So uh, it's a little awkward for me to talk around the text and not talk from it, but I'm going to have to do a little bit of that. The other awkward thing is that I'm a Bible teacher, and this session is the one session where you're going to use very little of your Bible, because I need to tell you what your Bible is before we open it up. So let's talk in uh, terms of uh, a number of things that are, we're going to talk about during this session. This session is about what the Bible is not. This session is about two worlds, World 1.0 and World 2.0, as though it were made by Microsoft. Um, this is also this, uh, a, a quick study of what I'm calling what the Bible's about in one simple story. God is a romantic, and the Bible is about two marriages. We're going to simplify all 66 books into one simple story. Then I want to talk to you about why there are seven different types of literature in the Bible. And it's because we don't, we don't all love the same way. We don't all think the same way in our language of love. Gary Chapman helped us with a book that said that, but the truth is anybody who knew anything about marriage already knew that. My wife thinks taking out the trash is one of the most romantic things I do. <laughs> and that's probably because I'm not terribly romantic. 
But I've learned a few things about marriage, and one of them I will pass on to every man in this room. Radial tires is not a proper gift for an anniversary. I just <laughs> pass that on to you. The other thing I want to talk about is, you got all these prophets in the Bible. Is there any difference between them? How many of you have read through the prophets section and you felt like the uh, adults on Peanuts? Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> Bad stuff for people that are now dust. Good promises to the people that aren't me. Why do I need this? And because of that, we lose track of why there are different prophets and what those prophets mean. So I, I want to dive into the subject, but I want to begin with what the Bible is not. We're at an important time of history. Um, the Bible is, is preached in some popular circles like it's the yellow brick road to Oz. Like if you just get on the page of what it is, somehow it will answer your problems and your greens will be greener and your blues will be bluer and your whites will always come out good in your laundry. Follow the Bible and life will be just one big song. Let me ask you something. Has anybody found that to be true? I, I actually have studied all 1,189 chapters. I'm on my 10th year of teaching through them in America, and I can tell you I found more problems in my life than I knew I had before I started them. I can't even get myself halfway into a good sin without hearing the Spirit go, thou shalt not. Well, that's not fun. They, they sold me a bill of goods. If I could just read this, my bank account would increase. When I give a penny, I'd get back $1,000. I've heard the guy say it. And he's got 13 suits, 13 sermons, and white hair. So why shouldn't it be true? And the truth of the matter is that there's a wall of cynics that is facing a weakened church. In history, the, the biblicity of the church held back the immorality waves that came up against it. But we don't have the church we had 50 and 100 years ago. Daniel Wallace said it this way. Those in ministry must close the gap between the church and the academy. We, uh, we have to educate believers. Instead of trying to isolate lay people from critical scholarship, we need to insulate them. They need to be ready for the barrage because it's coming. Now listen. Intentional dumbing down of the church for the sake of filling more pews will ultimately lead to defection from Christ. Let me suggest to you that young people are being sent out of a Sunday school and a youth group and walking right into a professor who has them targeted and says, I'm going to tell you why your mama and your preacher were a bunch of redneck hillbillies and I got the truth. And we're walking them in unarmed. And my life now is about 20-year-olds and picking up the pieces. Several of my students arrived after their college experience to find out if the Bible still even existed. You know, we're in an increasingly secularized, deliberately secularized environment in America. If you follow entertainment, you know that the Da Vinci Code and other movies have deliberately tried to give the impression that there's no reliability in the translation of what's in front of you. ABC TV uh, put together something called The Search for Jesus, and Peter Jennings came on because he's got a little accent and they like that, and he told a story of an unrecognizable to the gospel mind man who was a Jewish cynic who was killed because of an insurrection against Rome who was eaten off of the cross by dogs. That was the story Peter Jennings told. And if you don't think it had impact, it showed in high schools across America during class. You, you're, if you walk around with Jesus is the reason for the season, you're going to be taken to the school board. But if you want to show Jesus getting eaten off the cross by dogs, that's fodder for the morning literature class. National Geographic. I've done work for Discovery, for, uh, for History Channel, and for National Geographic. I love all three because they put the money in your bank 24 hours later, and I love being paid on time. But I got to tell you that they're not, there's no historians in those groups. These are lawyers. These are bankers. Their job isn't to tell you the truth. Their job is to get you to keep watching. And one of the things they will do is boldly assert that the Bible is full of errors. I just want you to remember one line. The Bible is criticized most by the people who read it the least. 
I get into university classrooms. I've been in a number of them this year. It's not the students I have problems with, it's the professors I have problems with, because they're sure the Bible's full of mistakes until I ask them to show me a couple. And then they stand there befuddled because they don't actually own a Bible. And I say academic integrity demands that you read the text before you tell me what's wrong with it. Popular marketed books like The Orthodox Corruption of Scripture or Lost Christianities were put out by Professor Bart Ehrman, who's at Chapel Hill in North Carolina. Bart came through evangelical schools, and now he makes it his living to target young evangelical Christians and destroy their faith. That's what he does. By the way, he can get on CNN at the drop of a hat. I've worked with these guys, and here's what I can tell you. You want to be critical of the scriptures, you will get a hearing just like that. You want to stand up and try and say there's evidence for them, and you will fight tooth and nail to get a hearing. So we're not on an even playing field in, in the world in which we're living. We're on a slanted one. Now, the, before we, um, we open our Bibles for study, I just want to suggest to you that there is a massive, massive amount of information that verifies the text that's in your hand. I spent my life in archaeology and I'm no fool. I'm not running around peddling something to get you to believe it when I don't believe it. I do. And I believe it because I've taken the time to walk. I remember, I remember when people said, Moses, oh, come on, it was an illiterate culture. Do you know how much written epigraphy we have from the time of Moses now? You, you could choke a mule with the size of the things that we have in writing, and that illiterate culture suddenly wasn't illiterate when somebody actually decided to dig up the paperback library. I, I remember when they said Hittites. There's no such thing as Hittites. Outside the Bible, we've never Hittite found any Hittites. Guess what? They dug up Hattusis and found it was the largest single city in the ancient world. Now suddenly, guess what? The Bible was right. Who knew there were Hittites? I, I've been around it this long enough to know that when Acts 13 talks about Sergius Paulus and says that there was this man, Sergius Paulus, who was this procurator for uh, the, the region uh, uh, under Rome, and they said, well, of course, there's no Roman record for this. How many of you know that there's a book right now, Reza, um, uh, Reza, 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 what's his name, called The Zealot? Has anybody seen this book? It's a New York Times best-selling book. You can take courses on this book in state universities. Reza Aslan is his name. He, he said, you know what? The way I found out that the Gospels are not true, by the way, he's Muslim, because if you really want to know a good story about Jesus, what you do is you go hire a Muslim. Um, <laughs> and, and he wrote a book that I can now study at University of Central Florida. I can get credits for this. And it says that the way I knew that the gospel wasn't true was because it opens up with a census in Luke chapter 2. And you know, the Romans kept really good records of censuses, and there is not a single record of that census anywhere. Men and women, he's telling the truth. There is not a single record of that census anywhere. But what he's not telling you is that we know of 250 censuses, and do you know how many records after the burning of Rome we have on censuses? Two. What he's not telling you is the germane fact that we don't have the record of most censuses. That doesn't mean we don't know they happened. It just means that they burned the city and we don't have a record of that one. And he used that as damning proof on NPR and in his book and is now being taught in our colleges. See, just take pieces of the facts but don't tell the context and you can get away with murder. One, interestingly enough, in 1961, there was a group of guys who were digging at Caesarea by the Sea. And Caesarea by the Sea is one of the many ports of the Mediterranean world, but this one was built by Herod the Great. Antonio Frova, the uh, Italian archaeologist, when he was digging, found a stone, flipped it over, and on it, it said Tiberium Pontus Pilatus. And they all went, hooray, now we know Pontius Pilate was a real person. And I always say the same thing, how stupid. You didn't know he was a real person when the, when the New Testament said it, but now he's written on a rock and now he's a real person. That's amazing to me. Archaeology is not supposed to be a proof for the Bible. The Bible's self-authenticating. You came in here believing it's the Word of God or you don't. And were they to come back from the dead, you would yet not believe. And you know how I know? Because they did and some don't. 
And that's the way it is. So either you're going to believe it or you're not. But I'm going to tell you that if you're with the archaeology, the ball is definitely rolling in our direction. I want you to know that what essentially I'm saying in archaeology is this. What one generation posits as an intractable problem in the scriptures, the next one gets a shovel, digs up, and finds the truth. Now, let me say it this way. If you believe in the historicity of the text, the ball's going in your direction. And the more we dig, the more we find. And the more we find, the more confirmation we get. I'm not saying there aren't any problems. I'm saying I've been doing this 30 years, and there is more evidence now for my position of the historicity <clears throat> of the scriptures than there ever was 30 years ago. And with every year, another 65 digs, and in those 65 digs, here's what we find. Guess what? You're going to be shocked. The Bible gives legitimate, real history. But archaeology isn't the only place. Wouldn't you expect, if, if Jesus was a real person, let's just go with me for a minute. If Jesus was a real person, wouldn't you expect that somebody besides those who believed in him, some, some other writer would make reference to him? And guess what? They do. In the year 55, a fellow by the name of Talus said, you know, the strangest thing happened. There was this terrible earthquake and this darkness that came over the city of Jerusalem one day. It was a day they were executing some guy. How about, how about somebody like uh, Tacitus, who's by, by far, Cornelius Tacitus was by far the best historian we have from 55 to 120 when he lived. Tacitus very, very clearly says that these people uh, uh, came around one called Christ and they executed him under someone called Pontius Pilate during the reign of Tiberius. Suetonius, who's a less reliable but nevertheless a colorful historian, uh, said, you know, under the Emperor Claudius, there were a whole bunch of people who were punished. They were inflicted because they were given to a new and mischievous religion. They followed one out named Crestus. If you talk to Pliny the Younger, Pliny watched his, uh, his uh, uncle die when Mount Vesuvius uh, was erupting in 79 in the Bay of Naples. He writes a very interesting letter to the then emperor and says, I got a problem with these Christians. I don't know what to do with these Christians. Can you help us with this rising tide of, of these Christians? And he talks about how to deal with the whole issue of rising Christianity. So here's my point. Archaeology points to the veracity of the story of the Bible. History correlates the story of the Bible. Not without problems, but let me tell you something. We have more to authorize that Jesus was walking on the earth and died on the cross in the first century than that Julius Caesar was ever the dictator of Rome. I've got a hundred times more written material on Jesus than I got on Caesar. And in any historical university in this country, they will validate Caesar and question Christ. Because it's not a level playing field. There's plenty of historical cross-reference. All right, so what, what do we have? My favorite picture of all times, by the way, the image here is not just a bunch of people trying to get bread. Uh, the, the book of Ezekiel is about reverence. It's about holiness, and we're not skipping it in our churches because it is hard. We're skipping it because its basic fundamental message is at odds with our culture. The book, if it had to say, I love Warren Wiersbe. He put, he put Be Reverent in his B series on this. The bottom line is we are a very irreverent culture because we want to be all that we can be and have it our way. That's the culture we are. It, this book was skipped by the church at critical hours of the church when it most needed it. That's what the picture's for. Let, let me say some thing, uh, things about, my, my favorite picture is in, um, is in the Vatican Museum, which by the way, if you're a historian and you love uh, art historian, um, you're probably gonna say the same thing since they've got like 40% of all the world's art. But the, the wonderful picture of Plato and Aristotle, maybe you've seen this, it's called the School of Ath Athens, Raphael, and you remember that uh, they're walking through a gallery, and you have the older man, Plato, and he's walking, sort of, uh, uh, he's balded, and he's got kind of long hair, and, and then you have Aristotle. 
And, and Plato is pointing up to the stars, and Aristotle is pointing down to his feet. Aristotle's the snappier dresser of the two. He's got more things than modern conveniences. The reason I love that story is because before Christianity ever existed, this same battle was going on that sets the stage for the background of what the Bible is. The battle is about what cosmogony you believe in. Cosmology is the study of the cosmos. But cosmogony is how it got here. And by the way, there are really only two. When you get right down to it, America is struggling, not with red states and blue states. America is, is struggling over which cosmogony it's going to tell. You cannot have half the university saying there are no absolutes and the other half teaching math and science in absolutes. We have schizophrenic universities and we have schizophrenic graduates who believe there are absolutes when it comes to math and there are absolutes when it comes to science, but when it comes to human behavior, there are none. That actually doesn't work. So the cosmogenies that we come down to, the two that we have to realize are first of all natural. Natural cosmogony is a very simple thing. It's naturalism posits that everything can be found but can only be found in a picture of being, existence, and it excludes the uh, supernatural. In other words, naturalism teaches, he it's the old beer commercial. Doesn't get any better than this. You only go around once. Everything that is can be seen and touched and felt. That is the official position of 50 states, state universities, naturalism. First, it, 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 all the hypotheses have to be explained and tested within methodological naturalism. And, and here's the thing, there's nothing that cannot be quantified according to natu naturalism. Now there's an important reason why I'm bringing this up because the second corollary is that nature is best accounted for by reference to material principles, that is, mass and energy and physical and chemical uh, properties. The second part is now the basis of our, our, our issues of science. It's the first part that Christianity has trouble with. I don't have a problem with using science to measure things. I have forensic archaeology as my background. My clients, by the way, never talk back. They're all dead. But you can dig them up, and you can look at them, and you can, I can tell you how, how old this girl was when she died. I can tell you if you give me a piece of the inside of her tooth, whether her hair was curly or straight, what color it was, what color her eyes were. I can tell you what the deficiencies in her diet uh, were, and I can also tell you how many children went through her birth canal. Those things can all be known. By the way, the birth canal thing is you check the, uh, you check the, uh, um, pelvic bone, and you run your finger along the pelvic bone, and there's a crack that forms with the birth of each child, and then it's covered over within the first several weeks by a calcium deposit, but it leaves a bump. So if you thought you were coming apart, you really were. The, the, <laughs> now, now the, the point is, with, if you, naturalism comes down to this, nature is all there is, and all the basic truths are found in nature. The logical conclusion to the basis of, of, of this life is this. There are no moral constraints. That's why Dawkins said we swallowed evolution because it killed God and freed morality. You want to know the driving force behind this? It's professors that want to date their students. That's the whole thing right there. If there's nothing right or wrong, because if it cannot be quantified, it cannot be real, then love doesn't exist. You are a twisted virus in a cosmos created by nothing with no particular reason going nowhere. Now go out and behave. That's what they're telling them. And they figure it out. If it doesn't matter, if only the fittest will survive, then why don't I go beat up all the old people and take their stuff? See, naturalism produces brutishness. Hang on, because it's the next wave. We're graduating naturalists. But they're an interesting group. The American naturalists are victims. They're people who have professionalized victimization. Somebody did me wrong. And so the court is clogged with them. Now, in, in uh, direct 
contrast and contradistinction to them, we have revelatory cosmogony. We, we choose to believe that there is a God, that he spoke, and that that was a deliberate choice of his. I can't prove it. I had a young man come to me and say, you cannot prove God. I said, all right, well, tomorrow night I'll tell you what I want you to do. Walk out and look up. Now, I want you to look at one quintillion stars and decide something, put them there or didn't. Then I want you to ask this question. Is there anything you've ever seen in all of your life that had design but no designer? In other words, is there evidence, cosmological evidence? The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. That's either true or it's not. But it is a choice. You can look all the way up there and go, yeah, that just happened. The Bible calls you a fool, but if you want to do that, you can feel free to go right ahead. But that's not the only reason. Not only does design require a designer, but in science, every effect has a cause. So when you go back before, before, before all the science stuff you're telling me, the answer is why? Why did it happen? Science offers me lots of ways to understand things that happen within a small box. But here's the natural university that we have today. I don't know how I got here, I don't know why I'm here, and I don't know where I'm going, but I got me an education. <laughs> and what you're doing is creating a hopeless generation. And by the way, the rights of every individual that are sitting in this room today are hinged to a group of men who understood inalienable rights were given by a God who created us. And if you erase the God who created us, you can erase those rights. Beside which, I mean, when you actually look at it, why am I telling you this? Because before you open the Bible, you need to understand something. We're not, we're not, we're not fighting between red states and blue states. We're fighting between naturalism and a revelatory cosmogony. We're fighting between people who believe that there are inalienable rights because there's a God, and people who believe, I get to do what I want. That's what we're fighting between. And yes, more of them group to one side or the other, but the fact of the matter is you'll find some of each in each. That's why I'm a purple American. And what I can tell you is this. We're going to approach this. By the way, normally my, uh, my young people today, they're not atheists. Atheism was so 70s and 80s. They're not atheists. They're agnostics. What's the difference? Because they don't believe that there isn't a God or there is. They believe that, you know, to say that you really know there's a God or there isn't, that's so, like, judgy. <laughs> So the current generation walks around going, I have a degree which has now qualified me to say that you cannot know anything. <laughs> These are the people running the systems of our life. And that's part of the problem, modern agnosticism. All right, so let me, let me tell you where we're approaching this, because I don't know who you are. First of all, I'm going to come at this as though there is a God. I'm going to come at it as though he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible, that not only there is a God, but that God spoke, and that we have his message because God began everything in relationship. And I want to talk to you for just a minute about one thing before we go further. It's the difference between you and your kids and your grandkids. You and I were educated with what's called Aristotelian logic. Aristotelian logic, by the way, this changed in 1961, the year I was born. Up until 1961, American students went to school and they learned if A is true and B is the opposite of A, then B is false. That's Aristotelian logic. In 1961, from Columbia University, a series of think tank professors decided that they would come together and teach us a brand new logic the logic that is prevailing in your children and in your grandchildren and in the mainstay of America, and it is this. A is true for A and B is true for B, and A cannot tell B what is true for B. Now that works until you're banking. You know, my feeling about how much I have in the bank is not relevant if it's different than the bank's feeling about how much I have in the bank. <laughs> Postmodernism then, let me just say where this went. Postmodernism went to deconstruction. I'm, I'm telling you all that this is not just blah, blah, blah. There's a reason I'm doing this, and it'll come up later in the book. Here's the bottom line. 
Sunday morning, we get together, we open our Bible, and we have two different ways of thinking about what's in front of us. And even the young person that says, I believe this is the word of God, has been taught a postmodern deconstructionist version of how to read a narrative. Not just the Bible, any narrative. Postmodernism posits that, and it's taught in most major universities, all the way back to 1968. Listen to this. It was called The Death of the Author. The professor remarked, the origin of the text is not the important thing, only the destination, only the reader. When the reader is allowed to invent new meanings, the text is freed from the, from the, uh, the tyranny of any author's single intent or meaning. You, you've got to understand, deconstruction in literature means that that 45-year-old that guy, that 27-year-old kid sitting there Sunday morning is hearing your message, but he's going, this is how it feels to me. It doesn't matter what Ezekiel was or the context he was in. You will labor hard to teach that and it will go right over their head because they were told that's not important. So you'll go to a Bible study and 15 people will tell you how they felt about the text, as if that's the relevant thing. That might have more to do with a pizza you ate last night. <laughs> and I'm telling you that because we're sitting in rooms with other Christians and we don't understand they can't hear us. They've been educated to see the same words on the page without the ability to hear what we're saying. So we say, the text says this, and they say, yeah, to you. But to me, it says, what I want you to understand is that right in the middle of this, a young group of my colleagues in ministry, in order to fill the seats, have decided that what we need to do then is stay away from doctrine and move toward experientialism. Yes. And that's a great answer to get you to the wrong destination. And the bottom line is what you'll have are people who are wholly committed to they know not what. I have young people who are throwing their stick on a fire, and it could be Jesus or Buddha. They don't know. They're totally dedicated to the, to the starchy diet, the late nights they've had at camp. But they don't really know the content of the word. There are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. You either know them or you don't. That, that's just the truth. So I go out and I sell... Great Commission Bible Institute with one line. If you already know what's in Haggai and Habakkuk and you already know how it works in your life, you don't need us. And if Ezekiel is like this big 48 chapter mystery to you, then you might want to spend some time actually studying it. I commend you for doing that today. But here's the bottom line. We have rooms full of kids getting together and they don't even know why that's important. Let, let me move on very quickly to, to, to talk about what the Bible teaches about our world. There, one day, a, a time management expert came in, and uh, he took a, a jar, a big pickle jar, five-gallon five pickle jar, set it on a stool, and he took all these rocks, big rocks, and he put them inside, and he filled the whole thing up to the top with rocks, and he said to the students of all these time management people who had come to pay this guru money, is the jar full? And they looked at the jar full of rocks and they said, well, yes. And he said, no. And then he reached down and he took some gravel and he put some gravel and he began to shake the jar and pour the gravel in the top and the gravel made its way down between the big rocks. And then he said, is the jar full? And the class said, yes. And he said, no. And he took some sand and he brought it up and he poured it over the top and he shook it and down through all the gravel and the big stones, the sand filled it up. And he said, is the, is the jar full? And the students said, we think it is, but we're going to say no because we get it wrong every time. <laughs> So then he took some water and he put it up and he poured it inside and then he got it up to the top in this soupy mess of sand and gravel and stones and says, is it full? And they said, yes. And he said, yes, it is. And what does this teach you? And one time management guy says, there's always more time to get more in. No, that's not what it teaches you. If you don't get the big pieces in first, you'll never get them in. So you start with the big pieces. 
Ezekiel is about the majesty and holiness and glory of God. It's about the reverence of man and his need to encounter him, but it's mostly about one prophet. It's a love story about a guy whose heart is broken. And the love story goes something like this. If you don't see me, you'll never be able to stand up in front of the false prophets of your day and speak truth. If you don't feel what I feel, you'll never be an effective communicator of what I need you to say. That's Ezekiel. That's its story. 48 chapters, and halfway through the book, the man's wife dies, and he's not allowed to cry because God told him he can't. This is a romance book. If you don't like romance books, you're not going to like the book. At the same time, I want to just stop and say the Bible offers us some stories that are incredibly important. In the very, very beginning, in the mind of a God who always was, way back when, God decided to create a world. We're going to call it World 1.0 after Microsoft, and th there, which means there has to be updates to follow because the first one's going to be flawed. Um, but he, he decides, to, if you don't have a Microsoft product, you have no idea what we just said. <laughs> last week, I was, in, I, was in, I was preaching last week, and I said, uh, I was talking about a product I got from Ikea, and I simply said, Swedish, that's the word for puzzle. No one who hadn't, didn't have an Ikea product knew what I was talking about. Went right over their heads. But if you, if you have one, you know 3,000 pieces and one picture to tell you how it goes together. Anyway, the, the important thing is that God in the past decided in his own mind that he would create an incredible universe. It was colorful. It, was, it, it had sound and beauty. He created beings, but he created a set number of them. Millions of them, but a set number. There was no sexuality in them. They were all one thing. But, but here's what's interesting. He created them in four ranks. Cherubim, seraphim, archangel, angel. And he created a world and a universe. And he was happy. And they sang to him. And they did whatever angels do together when they go out on camping trips, paint each other's nails. I don't know. But they were doing things. They were having fun, flapping around and whatnot. And then one cherub closed to God decided he would peel away in rebellion and took a third of them away. Stop. Just remember this. The number with God was always greater than the number against him. Enemy uh, sa Satan likes to fluff up. The enemy likes to fluff up to make himself look bigger. He's never been the majority. Never. But a third peeled off. Now the other two-thirds were with their maker, and they saw God, and they saw him watch them peel off, and, and, and they thought, surely he's going to go, blah, and they're going to die. But he doesn't. Instead, he turns to the two-thirds of the angels that are with him, and he says, sit down for a minute. Park your wings. I want to tell you a story. And in the middle of that, he decides to whip up another universe, World 2.0. In this universe, it's a little bit characteristically different than the first one. The first one was metaphysical, this one's physical. He flung into the cosmos one quintillion stars. He spun planets around them, did a little extra color, and then chose, out of his own mind, one, one solar system, one star, spun some planets around it, and the third rock from that star said, watch what I do here. Bam! put a garden on it, and he created a world. And he deposited into that world a man and a woman. And the shocking part of the story is he did not defend them from the other third, and slithering into the garden was one who said, I can make you strong. And man and woman defected on that third rock from the sun and joined the third in rebellion and mutiny. And all the angels went, God, look! And he said, wait, wait, I'm telling a story. I'm the writer of the story. Follow my story. I got a plan. He walked down onto that earth, and he looked at that snake and said, you're very, very, very slick. You're going to chew dust. And you're going to wound badly, 
the child of this woman, but he's going to crush your head. Take your time, because I'm not in a hurry, but just know this is over when I say it is. And he develops the story of human history. And at the end of human history, look at the last page of Revelation and you will see this story. Written on the foreheads of the people who are known to be God's people is the great name I am. Yahweh. Jehovah. Because the last part of the story, when God says I'm a trophy of His grace, I really am. I'm a trophy played in a movie. Now who's the movie for? the cosmos that's been watching since we were created. The Bible isn't the story of redemption. It isn't the story of destruction. It isn't the story of wrath or of judgment. It is the story of God and who He is. And there is no other explanation for why bad things happen to good people other than watch my story, I finish what I start. So you might be a Naomi, and you might lose a husband and two children. And you might be sitting there saying, call me bitterness, God has dealt bitterly with me. And you might surrender your heart and open your hand, and God may fill it up with himself. And from that which he fills up in the kinsman redeemer comes generations later King David and generations later King Jesus and, and generations later the salvation of all humanity and it came from your suffering but you didn't live long enough to know. See this story started before you were born and it keeps going on long after you're gone. We're not done till the trumpet sounds and the bottom line here is World 2.0 was made within World 1.0 as a movie for angelic entertainment. That's what it's for. So when you open up your Bible, you're looking at a story, and in the biblical worldview, the reality is that God is trying to tell his story. Listen, I want to go even one step further. Now let's go inside the story, the movie. What's the movie about? The movie's about two marriages. If you open up the pages of Genesis, you find that God created the heavens and the earth. And by chapter 11, middle of chapter 11, God said, you know what, there's a people that I am going to marry. I'm going to bequeath and love this people. I'm going to engage myself and then I'm going to marry this people and I will forever love them. The sun, moon, and stars will fall before I will ever give up on my love for them. I have an everlasting love for them. And it's not because they're cute. In fact, archaeologically, they have bigger noses than most of the people in this room. <laughs> they stand on an average five foot two. They have, are mulatto complected. Nice suntans, never used oil. Uh, truthfully, they're not better looking. Read the story. They're not more friendly. Grace is not one of their natural characteristics. But God in His sovereignty said, I love this people. I'm going to call them the sons of Abraham through Isaac, through Jacob. And just to make sure we don't spiritualize this, he said to Abraham, they will come through your loins. Now that's about as genetic as you can get. And I am going to love them with an everlasting love. And I'm going to marry them. And Hosea says, and, and I married them. And I made a beautiful vineyard and a beautiful home. And they went cheating on me. And not just once. They became known as the town whore. And, and in reality, I had to withdraw my hands and divorce my loved one that I said I would always love because I still love her, but I cannot have her do that. But she didn't get a divorce from him, and he did not divorce her until they had a son. And that son was the combination. I'm, I'm cheating on Revelation 12. You know that, so that's what I'm doing. And that woman bore that son. And that son was told to walk on the earth and love not one people, but many. Not choose one nation, but people of every tribe and kindred and nation and tongue. And offer them a betrothal. And in that betrothal, there's coming a day. It could be today. 
when a trumpet sounds and God the Father calls the son's bride to come up. See, we're not married yet. We're just engaged. You know how they always say the best behavior you'll ever get out of them is when you're dating and engaged to them? <laughs> That's what scares me about the church of Jesus Christ. And so he calls us up. And when, and when that bride and that groom are married in a wedding feast in heaven, when that happens, meanwhile on the earth, God looks back at his estranged, broken, beaten, used up bride and says, by the way, I still love you. And I'm going to kick the stuffings out of this old earth until finally you bow your neck. Mm -hmm. And at the end of seven terrible, horrible years, she says, enough. I'm ready. And the end of the Bible is that the son and those who are married to him come to rescue the estranged wife of the father. By the way, I'm in row 1,377,464, third from the left. <laughs> and, and just in case you don't know, 2.0 Randy is gorgeous. <laughs> 1.0 is what it is. So my point is that that's the story. The story is a story of two marriages. Now, when God tells us the story, he tells us the story not in what would make some of you happy. Some of you would be very happy if the whole story was just epistles. You would love it if the whole Bible was epistles. You spend all your devotional time on, just tell me what I'm supposed to do. All right? Tell me about the theology of infralapsarianism, because I like to look smart when I go to work. And now tell me that I'm supposed to do this, act this way. Epistles are just one of the ways that God speaks. That's not all of them. Yes, he speaks in terms of epistles, but he speaks in many different ways. The problem is your Bible has a mistake in it. Every one of your Bibles has it. In the 8th century, somebody decided that when they were reading Hebrews 7, 8, and 9, that that which was old and done away meant books of the Bible and put in the front of your Bible Old Testament. There's no Old Testament. Okay? There's, there's Hebrew scriptures written to the Hebrew people. But the problem is when you put old and then you put new, it's like you got the new improved version. And they got the old, dusty, dead version. No, there's part of the Bible that is directed to God's estranged wife. And part of it that is directed to the betrothed of the son. But it's not old and it's not new. And it's not somehow more God's word because it's in Colossians than if it's in Leviticus. The question is, who did God tell to do what he said in the passage? That's the question. Not whether it's old we're new. By the way, the big problem we have is that people want to take the Bible and look like God just dropped it to a kid in New Jersey. There are four ways to get married in Corinth. There are only two in Florida. I don't know what you got going on up here in Ohio. I can't really speak to that. But, but, it, but in, in, in Corinth, a man could trade his daughter in a debt for a pleasurable service woman to a man who's already married, and that's a considered a second but legal marriage. So when you're reading 1 Corinthians 7, you might want to know there are four ways to get married, not two, and half the things we're reading out of the text aren't even about things we do anymore. Why is that important? Because people are making up morality from stuff that doesn't have to do with the cultural law they understand. So the culture becomes relevant. And what people are doing is they wander through the Bible and they're saying things like, well, you know, all the scripture was written for us. And so some guys are running around going, we got to keep the Sabbath. All right, well, then kill a goat to make God happy. Because you don't get to select out one verse and not the other. Either you're going to be consistent and find a consistent uh, method of study of the scripture, or you're going to be all over the place. <coughs> this happened to me. I'm in a youth meeting, and a guy's standing there saying, I told Johnny he can't have a tattoo. I showed him right here in Leviticus where you can't have a tattoo. And he was eating a ham sandwich when he was telling me. <laughs> And I thought to myself, do I shut up or do I walk into this one? And of course, you know what I did. 
So here's my point. One of the important things we have to understand is that the Bible contains seven different ways of telling God's love. The 54% uh, by Randy's un, uh, unauthorized way of cutting up Bibles all over his apartment shows that 54% of the Bible's biography. That means it's drama. You think TNT knows drama? God knows drama. And the drama is about, specifically, God working in flawed people who are falling all over themselves, who will foul up a two-car parade, and God showing himself through their lives. But some people don't get it through bi biography. They need prescriptive epistle. When you get sick, you go to the doctor. You have certain symptoms. He writes a prescription. The prescription only works if you fill it and then take it. Use only as directed. OK, so prescriptive epistles are where God says, you're sick. Here's what you need. There's also lamentations. These are very, very tough. I mean, when was the last time you heard a rousing devotional from the Daily Bread on happy shall he be when he bashes the heads of their babies against the stones? It's in the Bible. But what's it about? Or, God, you're not fair. People are getting away with murder down here, and you're sitting on your hands up there. What are you doing? That's a Bible verse. Is it true? Is it, do we tear it out? How do we deal with it? Well, you have to understand how a lamentation works. Then there's a whole bunch of legal code and covenant treaty. How many of you figured out that there's lots of legal code in Scripture? And the problem is, in the period of the Hebrew Scriptures, you had a bunch of people who had these laws, and then they went off into Babylon, which was the oldest lawyer town in the world, and when they came back, they all came back as legal experts, like we are the day after the Supreme Court sends down something. If you look on Facebook, everybody has suddenly become a legal expert. And they come back, and if you spit on a rock on the Sabbath, you're okay. But if you spit on the ground, you're tilling the soil, and we need to get the rocks and start pummeling you. Between the Hebrew Scriptures and the Christian Scriptures, Babylon happened, and it changed everything. We're going to be dealing with that period of time. By the way, there's a whole section. This, can I be honest with you and tell you the hardest part of what I do during my year is teach wisdom literature to 20-year-olds? They've never paid a water bill. They have no wisdom. My standard of wisdom is, have you paid bills consistently? If you don't know what it means to do that, at any rate, God speaks in wisdom literature. He also speaks in poetry. How many of you really don't like the sections that are all poetry? Is there anybody else willing to go, yeah, I'm, give me an epistle any day of the week? This, you know, feeling my way through it. But here's, here's the point. Here's the point. When you take a look at that and you look at prophecy and poetry and look at the way God tells his story, what you should understand is that in all of that, something is happening. God knows that everybody in this room tells love differently. So he tells his story in seven different ways. Because some of you are going to really respond to poetry. You're going to love the musical section of Psalms. Others are going to just tell me what to do, will you? <laughs> Don't be humming at me. I just want to know what I'm supposed to be doing and not doing. Now, I've got to finish this up, and I want to say to you that not all prophetic words are the same. In fact, they're not all the same at all. There are four different kinds of prophets in the Hebrew Scriptures. The first ones are, and I'm going to do these as a parent, okay? So go with me on this because I'm a parent. The four kinds are, begin with, divided kingdom prophets. This sounds really lofty. Here's what this is. After Solomon in 928 dies and, and the kingdom is divided between north and south, you got prophets coming up in the north and prophets coming up in the south. And it sounds something like this. You've never heard these words before. If you two don't knock it off, I'm coming up there with the belt. That's divided kingdom prophets in the very high, resounding, academic way in which I'll tell you. In other words, two kingdoms, both walking the wrong way, God saying, I'm sending to you somebody that says, you better knock it off, I'm going to deal with you. Then there's another kind, the Judah alone prophets. Now, the older brother has now been spanked. Israel has been taken out. And now the next kind of prophet is, I told the two of you I was coming up there. Now I came up there and got your older brother. Do you want a piece of this too? That's what I'd call Judah alone prophets. 
And for that 134 years, that's what they're about. Then we have, all right, all right. Nobody wants to listen. I told you to stop spitting water at each other. You didn't stop doing it. You spanked in that corner. You spanked in that corner. Don't look at each other. Don't snicker. You might live through the night. And what you have are two groups of people in exile. And by the way, the younger brother thought the older one was gone forever. Because 150 years passes and they don't even know where the Assyrians took the older group. And they just assumed they were gone for good. And then in the midst of the punishment, then comes the word that comes to the post-exilic prophets. These are the guys that say, all right. Come on back. Let me give you a hug. I do love you. Do we have to do this again? Or can Dad go down and finish watching his movie and the two of you just go to bed and shut up? Did anybody ever have this story happen in their house? <laughs> I grew up with between 12 and 15 children at a time in my house. This is what we called Tuesday night. And what I can tell you is this. You feel like you're going through lots of prophets, but I would challenge you, the seven prophets that are in the first section are not like the three prophets in the next section. The sound is different according to where they are in the punishment. And that's my point. Okay? What do we do when we get to a break time? What are we supposed to do? Just go, it's a break time? He points to him, okay? We go, okay, it's a break time. <laughs>